working there. I'm sorry. Uh, you, referenced, you referenced the mainstream media and their reluctance to uh, make enough uh, noise about the uh, problem with uh, electoral integrity. And I know we have um, Fox News on the one hand and MSNBC on the other, and supposedly CNN. I won't say it. it. It appears to be in the middle, but I think that's a subject of debate. Um, but uh, since they're all owned by large corporations, um, it, it would appear uh, to me and possibly others that the, uh, the debate is framed um, and that there's very little discussion of suppression of the vote that even uh, MSNBC, while, while you did show a clip, that it's a very small fraction of the conversation and uh, it would seem to me that unless there was a much more, and it would seem to me that it's to the advantage of these corporations, but actually to continue to have uh, uh, Republicans in office to continue to uh, uh, dictate who's in office. and so. And, and to frame the debate. So yeah, we'll throw them a bone every now and then and make it look like we care, but we really don't. And this way we'll, we'll pacify them. So it, as long as the mainstream media uh, appears to be in, involved but is really pushing for one party, is there any way to really get a, a large uh, number of people concerned, uh, or, or have I read this incorrectly? I'm asking anybody, but you mentioned the mainstream media, uh, so... Um, well, as somebody who's worked in mainstream media and, and, and worked... Um, I mean, I'm disappointed, yeah, you that, I'm disappointed yeah. that this isn't... This and Citizens United and yeah. things like this aren't like major, major topics, and instead, I, while I appreciate that Russia is on, I mean, I think there's far too much time spent on, you know, Roy Moore in Alabama as a pedophile, when, you know, Citizen United is uh, stripping us of our fundamental rights. And I think that uh, it all comes back to the fact that Comcast owns MSNBC and they're getting tax breaks. So, so ma mainstream, you know, they're framing the debate. And so uh, where, how do you break through the fact that even, even Comcast is uh, a corporation that uh, needs to make profits for their shareholders? Okay. Thank you. Well, well, there's a bunch of different things there. So, so here's my perception as someone who's worked in mainstream media and outside of mainstream media. Um, and then, mainstream media is driven by advertising. In, in the internet era, advertising means keeping eyeballs in a 24-7 cycle with a whole lot more competition out there. And that's where you get all the hyped garbage. You've just seen this. No signal. Thing. HDMI one. One check the cable connection and the settings of the source device. Press two more. Press the source button below to select the connected source. You know what happens is you know you, you see something. You know somebody says something outside the White House. Then every single one of those networks will tell you what you've just seen, and you'll see it again. And then you'll have people who are talking heads put on camera because it's cheap. It's not investigative reporting. It's just get in a room and talk. And it goes on and on and on. And, and the thing about it is you'll see this with the polling. And it, until it comes election day when no one investigates where the polls are wrong. And, you know, and, and this is all about, it's all about making money. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, um, nobody gives a shit about Citizens United and, and um, you know, and, and these other topics. And I covered oh, them for NPR, by the way, and they had to be. Um, you know, I, I did more stories on public financing in the late 90s than anybody. They weren't interested. And, and the thing about it is it's because it's not as sexy or it's not as controversial and it doesn't bring in the eyeballs. And, and what's happened since then, and this is really important because we haven't talked about this today, is we really got to understand what happened with media in 2016. In 2016, the social media platforms became more, they had bigger viewership and more engagement than network television. And, and you really, and, and you know, everyone got freaked out about Russia. And I've written about e-books e about this with Jeff Chester from the Center for Digital Democracy. Everything Russia did was done 10,000 times more by Brad Parscale for the Trump campaign. So let's be really clear about this. And, and we're not talking about anything that is such a mystery. We are talking about, you know, using commercial advertising on social media and online media. And it's not just Facebook, by the way. It's also Google, which is, if you are on Gmail, 
Okay, let, let me just back up and say what this is, and then we can talk later about this. But you need to say what can be done. It's, we're really in a tough place, because what's, what happens is this. You have platforms that profile the users. You, you use it for free, but they get something. Mm -hmm. That something is your psychological profile. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you, so you have profiling, and you have what's called big data, which is based on all the stuff and what, and, uh, that about you. And then you, have the, the, then you have online advertising, which is micro-targeting. You know, it, it used to be broadcasting. You'd have, you know, I was Bernie Sanders press secretary when he ran for the House in 1990. Hmm. And, we had maybe 15 30 second ads on videos for the whole campaign. And that was all the entire state of Vermont got to hear. Now you have thousands, and it's not thousands, literally millions of messages that are put out on all these different platforms that are designed to respond to whether you like the color blue or green on a button, or if it's a square or a circle, you're more likely to push it. And the artificial intelligence that goes behind this, is, it's, it's, brain predict, it's predictive brain science designed to profile you and provoke basically impulse sales. Well, in the political world, wow. that's hateful behavior. Yep. So you have, you have the surveillance economy, you have, you have big data, you have targeted advertising. At Facebook, they call it look-alike audiences. So what did Trump do that Clinton didn't do? This is, this is totally, this is factual. Apart from sending out something like 10 times as many different message variations, what they did was, these are not just typical ads. These are things that pop up in people's posts. They're not labeled as ads. How did they get there? They go and they can search people by zip code and define characteristics and find things that are similar, that were written that by people who look like them. So if you're a gun nut or you're a guitar nut like me and you say, you know, this is the best recording of a Bob Dylan song. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is that? That's ridiculous. And then I get upset and I have to write something. Or I get engaged, uh, which has happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, um, then it, it will appear and it will follow you. And, and so, what, so what the Trump campaign did was they realized that lookalike audiences coming, with messages coming from people like their targets was a smarter way to reach people than official sounding press and policy statements from the wonk, wonkus in chief, Hillary. And when you hear about all well, the Democrats today saying, I have a plan, you know, and Marianne Williams saying, saying, hey, this is about something else that's more visceral. This is about something else that's more visceral. Now that's 2016, and that's how Trump won. That's how he, especially after that Comey thing, reannouncing the FBI investigation of 10 days before the election, it discouraged people from coming out. And you had all, this, you had all the people who were voting for Bernie who were told to vote, vote for Jill Stein, um, and, and, or vote for Gary Johnson. And you had a lot of, you know, people, you know, like, so anyway, that's what happened then. And that was, so where are we today? It's four years later. And I can tell you, because I was talking to people in Washington earlier this week, because I was at the DNC trying to cover their rules on their telephone voting at the Iowa and Nevada caucuses, which is insane. But I asked them, what are you going to do about di disinformation? And what they said was, right now, every, they can track anything that scales that is viral, and they can see whose computer, it, they can see the scale it happens, they can trace it to every individual's computer, they can see how long people are gonna be online watching this stuff, and they will then try to figure out what counter message to send back to you. So you don't even see, know that this stuff is going on as you're looking at the screen. So this is gonna be sort of the information warfare dynamics that are coming. Now I asked the Democratic Party's top data people, what do you do with disinformation? And they say, well, you have to find your friends to tell them, you know, to share stuff because relational information is gonna be more, you know, will break through the noise. Well, what if your relational information that you wanna believe is wrong? And what if it doesn't break through the noise? And I don't think it's, I think it's gonna be really hard to break through the noise because you know what? Television networks, elected Donald Trump because he was really, really good for business. And the head of CBS, you know, mm -hmm. bragged about that. Yep. And you know what? He's still good for business. Mm -hmm. So you have a liar in chief, mm -hmm. and when he goes out and calls, you know, you know, call, you know, you know, you know, all the nonsense he says, it's headline news. And it's more interesting than Citizens United. And it's more interesting than Elizabeth Warren's plan, you know, or something else like that. And so you've got, you've got that going on, you've got a gaslighter in chief, you've got the mainstream media that feels an obligation to report what they're saying as a statement of record. You've got 43% of the country who believes these alternate realities are true. 
and and you have and, and you have an inability to take unless there, are, there happens to be two democratic debates a month on, on 29 other days to control the narrative and that's the situation that you know, people are headed in with all this other stuff going on behind the screen and there's going to be you know and so so the television picture in this and the mainstream media picture in this <coughs> they're kind of like followers they're not throwing the first punch. They're just trying to feed off what they think is most incendiary to get ad revenues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that is like that's really where we're where it's at, and it's really, it's not you know it's it's scary, mm -hmm. you know. And then here we are thinking you know gosh let's pay attention to the finish line so we can at least believe who won. Yeah. <laughs> I want to introduce Jim Silver. So I was hoping to get Jim in because of time, and he's been delaying if we could, because then after that we can open this up to a discussion. Because it's definitely a good subject matter, and I thank Steve for going into that because I feel the same way. My computer now, as I'm typing, is giving me the rest of my sentence. Yeah. And only recently I'm seeing that. But Jim, thank you for being with us. Well, we would we, we think of having it without you. Thank you, brother. <coughs> You're Jeremy, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My name is Jim Soper. I am co chair of the Voting Rights Task Force, author of a website called Counted as Cast, as in every vote should be counted as cast.org. <laughs> And I'm a senior software consultant. In her text 200 e smart device, in her text 200 e your permission is required to connect your device to this key. Allow button. I I I that was your, who was that working with you? It's a smart device. Was somebody working with you there? I did take it. Moscow, obviously. You're not trying to show a part. No, no. You can just disconnect the computer. It's on me, it's that show, it's that. Yeah. Never mind, Laurie, it's... I turned it on. Never mind, I turned it on. Sorry, Jim. Mm -hmm. Can somebody give me my mouse here? Well, okay. yes, we certainly can. Thank you. Um, I told Lori, I don't know, an hour ago, I was changing my topic. Uh, because it sort of became apparent that maybe I could add a few things about what she should know for 2020 and put aside some other things till later. I, the original idea, uh, part of what I was going to do is I get really annoyed when people anywhere about anything but also in this space Say, there's only one way to do it. Very often I hear, it got to be hand counted in the precincts, the ballots on paper. Hand, hand marked paper ballots counted in the precincts. And I will just give you sort of my end line there and move on. The um, precincts are disappearing. With vote by mail, all over Washington, all over Oregon, all over. Colorado and about 60 70 percent of California but you don't have precincts anymore so how are you gonna hand count in the precincts so my question there and I'll just throw it out is what's your plan B because you, you better come up with a plan B and part of this uh, is you know, just not one way to do it and Jeremy can you raise your hand here this is Jeremy, uh, his, I know his father. He is currently translating parts of the French election code. Wow. The French? Electoral. They do the French right. election code. Yeah. And that's sort of a spin-off. I saw an article in Le Monde after the presidential election, and they said something that will shock 99% of the people here. On election night, they take all ballots that have not been questioned or disputed and they destroy them hmm. on election hmm. night yeah. we're talking about we got to keep the images and so on oh, throw them out 
<coughs> and I talked to Jeremy a bit about this. My guess is that goes back to the French Revolution, <laughs> which they were trying to establish some sort of democracy back then, and the whole thing was chaos. And it makes what we're looking at now a picnic, like a picnic. Louis the Sixteenth makes Donald Trump look like a stable genius, <laughs> and, and, and so there was a lot of dispute, and there was a lot of elections being hand counted, hand marked, hand counted, and the numbers were not nowhere real. And I think there they just wanted to. We don't want to have any more disputes after the night. Yeah. Yeah. It's done. Let's move on. So I think that's where it came from. That's a different history than what we have. Uh, I will echo again, I gave a little bit of two minutes of testimony in front of the California Senate uh, Elections Committee in March of a year ago. Somebody said, hey, did I see you on TV? I made TV. And <coughs> they just took one line out of my little talk, but they took the right line. The biggest threat is from insiders. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the programmers. <coughs> The election workers, the contractors, anybody who has easy access to this stuff. Of course, CBS Sacramento showed me that, and then they went back to the journalists who started talking about Russia. Mm. <laughs> Go ahead. Disconnect. Yep. Total disconnect. Okay, one of the things that's going on here, we have no machines coming online. And they have some problems. You would hope that after 10 years we get something better. Yeah. It's kind of getting worse. Um, we have ballot marking devices more and more, and that are totally evil, but they're In not California? great. California? Yeah. Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Yeah. Los Marin. Angeles. Huh? Marin. Marin. Yep. Marin. What? Uh, what, what we're seeing is a whole new California get a bunch of new money. There's a bunch of new federal money. Yeah. And so over the past year, the counties are buying new machines. Can you describe yeah. what they are, please? <laughs> uh, ballot marking devices. You go to a touch screen and you make your choices and then you say uh, print. And it prints out a list of your choices. On that. Which you are theoretically supposed to take over to a ballot box and put it in. It's a marking or ballot uh, printing device. I'm sorry, not marking, but printing. Marking is something else, but ballot printing device. So this can actually be somewhat easier for humans to audit. That's an advantage. I just read that recently. But as, as was being shown with these marks, on the ballots, if you're printing from the same machine, the same words, they're going to look exactly the same from one ballot to the next to the next, making it a lot easier to stuff the ballot box Absolutely. and nobody's going to notice. Which is why we are saying, you know, hand marked paper ballots. Uh, so we're seeing more and more, and yeah, Los Angeles is doing this. It, it, since 2009, they've been working on a brand new system. Some of the design, the interface is really quite good, and so on, but it's a ballot marking device, and it uses what a new feature is, QR codes. A QR code is that, you know, the box, you go into an airline and you say, oh, show your phone and it's got this box with a bunch of little black and white boxes Slip in away. it. That's printed on the Los Angeles ballot. And then you put it in a ballot box and when you they go to count the votes, they're not reading the name off of the ballot. They're reading the QR code. I don't know, my QR code isn't terribly fluent. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I look at it and I have no idea who I voted for. But that code is what they're counting. Los Angeles is doing this in more and more uh, machines, Dominion and I believe um, ESNS, but I'm not quite sure. They're coming out with the same stuff. And so this is like a problem. Now, theoretically, we can go back and head, audit all of that, but you've got to have 
a really good audit. Uh, but we're seeing this across the country. Also, almost worse, you can tell me if you think it's worse, I think John knows what I'm coming up with, is something called a hybrid. Yes. Ugh. And this is a touchscreen machine, and you make your selections and you say, cast vote. And that paper goes through a printer and directly into the ballot box. Mm. <coughs> Which means the voter never had a chance to check the paper. Oh, wow. Right, John? That's exactly right. Uh, they, they've had big fights in is. New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia over this kind <coughs> of stuff. It's just perfect for um, adjusting the ballot. It's, it's faith-based. <laughs> it's an honor based. system, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is getting more attention in Pennsylvania and New York, and so much thanks to Lulu Freestat, who you can go to smartelections.us, and she's been leading the charge against this, and she explains it and so on. Smartelections.us. Those machines are coming into California. San Francisco will have them and, and a bunch of other states. I will try at some point a voting rights task force and then Perens US to publish a list of which counties are going to be using which machines and whether they are, are or are not um, hybrids or whether or not they're going to be using QR codes. My general recommendation for Californians as of today, and actually for a while, uh, is to go get a vote by mail ballot, hand mark it, send it in. Send it in or not? Bring it in. Ah. You should, I think, but I'm not sure of this. You should be able to actually take it down to the precinct and hand it in there, and they will put it in a special bag, and that's better than the U.S. Post Office. Oh, wait, because it's the vote center now. Yeah. Depends on your county. I'm coming well, up to those. I'm coming center. up to those. Uh, but where are you going to vote? I don't know how they're going to react in 2020 when you hand them a vote by mail ballot. I've done that you know, eight years ago. And they just took it and put it in a, in a bag, and et cetera. My recommendation is... <coughs> to try to avoid these machines, vote by mail. And if you can, uh, especially if you have a vote center, which I'll explain in a second, uh, you can even hand that in earlier and see how they're going to react, whether, they, whether or not they're going to accept the ballot as is. I'm going to get back to my notes here. Okay, um, I will touch on for a moment, I'll get to both centers in a minute, the ballot image issue. Uh, and John and I have some discussions about this. I have been in favor of ballot images since 2009 or something when KPFA ra radio station ran an election for the board of KPFA. And I was asked to kind of help oversee that this was being done properly. And there they put all 3,000 ballots online. <coughs> and so I went up there and I saw 3,000 ballots. My God, I got the whole election right in front of me. Hmm. Fabulous. The very first ballot I took had a smudge on it. Hmm. And I was able to check with the cast vote record and I got counted. And then I sent out an alert to a couple of colleagues and said, be careful, look at this carefully. They wound up, about 15% of the ballots had a problem of the images. And they wound up having to just hand count the whole thing, which took three weeks. But I've been a friend, fan of ballot images ever since then because you've got the election in front of you. And that's how you found the error, it was the images. Huh? You found the error from the images, right? I found the error from the image. To the service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I like um, 
I like valid images. There is a problem which Steve touched on to a certain degree. And I went and talked last December t at a conference to ESNS and Dominion. And I said, you know, those images, when you're creating them, because they sort of take a photograph, and then the computer turns that into a, a digital file. And I asked, when you're creating that file, does that anything go on, going on with that other than just a pure picture? One of the companies said, yeah, we um, encrypt them. Hmm. We scramble them, so and you have to have the password to see what was originally there. Another one said, yeah, we compress them, which is to make the file smaller. At, in both cases, at that instance, whether, when they're encrypting or compressing or whatever, they can change the image. Whether or not they can do that at scale, I don't know, that would have to be tested. But it's a vulnerability. And they also can change hand marked paper ballots. Because me and Bill went through a recount, saw 30,000 of them done. And they printed brand new ones because it's redundancy that we want. Exactly. That's the name of the game. Bingo. Yeah, I'm getting right to okay, that. OK, good. I am in favor now. I mean, verified voting has been in favor of risk limiting audits, which we will talk about in a minute. But the. Uh, <coughs> They really are sort of against ballot images. I think some of them are, are coming over to accepting this. But if you take those ballots and run them through a separate scanner from a separate company, and what they did in Humboldt is they go down to Toys R Us and buy a $19,000 scanner and run all the ballots through them and then have so somebody use open source software to recount the new images, the second image. And those numbers better match pretty closely. I like that. I think that's, uh, in an ideal world, that's what we, we should be doing. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at with the ballot images. I like them, but I don't trust them 100% because I can, in my computer mind visualize how they could fit over the images at the point that they're either compressing or encrypting or whatever. Um, that's ballot images. Let me get this down. I had to type these notes out. Okay. Vote centers. Mm -hmm. This was established a couple years ago. A vote center is an idea of we're going to take, if Marin has, I don't know, I guess 500 precincts, we're going to cut it down to 50. Anybody can vote from that county, can vote anywhere in the county. If you live in Los Angeles and you commute an hour and a half to and an hour and a half from, this is an advantage because I can go to the vote center close to my place of work. Mm -hmm. I think that was maybe one, one of the big uh, pushes for it. The law that was passed uh, in Los Angeles has its own rules. And I have, on my county as gas website, you will see I believe it's called SB 360 on the left side. You can go and start to, I, I wrote notes on it. And I said, well, this section is about Los Angeles, read it. Because that wasn't going to take you know, another day to read what they were doing. <coughs> um, they will be open 10 days. What, to vote? For 10 days, not one day. Also a huge advantage, especially when you consider people going into precincts to want to vote and something's wrong, and they're, they're not going to have time to fix it. I mean, something you're not registered, you change your party, whatever. So we'll be open 10 days. Everybody will get a vote by mail ballot, whether they ask for it or not. Wow. 
in LA County? In any county, uh, a vote center is a county optional. I guess they're doing it in Marin. They're going to do it in LA. There are only five counties doing it. Five? Very few. Very few. Mm -hmm. uh, Which one? San Francisco is not. No. San Mateo is definitely one. San Mateo is going. So I, I don't know about the state as Sonoma, I understand maybe. it is moving 100% in this direction. The Secretary of State is, is pushing this. But the counties have to opt in. If they opt in, vote by mail for ballot, vote by mail ballots for everyone. They're open 10 days. And recently, somebody put in a lawsuit about uh, registering and changing your party registration and doing crossover ballots. The third thing they have to do is let you register or change your registration on the spot. So if you go in thinking you're a Democrat and you find out that you're a Libertarian, you, you're going to be able to say, I want to go, I want, I, I, I want to vote Democrat. And they have to be able to change it then and there. It's also in the law. It's a whole package. You get all of it or you get none of it. Are they going to give you a provisional ballot? If you change on yeah. the day of? Oh, I don't know. Yes. That's, That's I, I what it is. The answer is yes. Oh, the answer is yes. Oh. And we don't want that. Uh, uh, <laughs> we don't want that. You'll be able to change your party registration if they got it wrong. You'll be able to register on the day uh, that you're there. And this is where I sort of said, go early. If it's open for 10, 10 days, go on the first or second day. See if you get a problem. You'll have eight more days to straighten it out. Really? They'll be so that's coming. Yeah. The counties themselves must choose to do this or not do that. LA, San Mateo, Marin apparently are doing it. San Francisco is not. And the registrars there said, well, the geography of San Francisco is different than LA because it's very compact and you don't have to go far to get to your mm -hmm. precinct. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Also new, and this is something that I am proud of because the Voting Rights Task Force, and it's really his fault, <laughs> Richard Tab. <Tapp. Okay. laughs> uh, we did some lobbying uh, a year and a half ago. Um, following off of contact we had with Assembly Members Quirk, and helped, were involved in getting past AB 2125 which again makes county optional risk limiting audits. Any county that wants to may do that instead of the 1% manual tally. Only for 2020. I'm sorry? Only for 2020 election. It's, it, I think this is Either. a good point. Uh, some people wanted to have this permanent and it wound up being only for next year, 2020. And then it stops and people have to figure out what they want to do next. Mm -hmm. I think this is good. I like the idea of risk limiting audits. Theoretically, it should work, but uh, I'm in a hard, a hard bit in senior software consult. I want to see it used in practice. I want to see what happens. And then after a year, we can go back and... Can you explain it? Okay. Can you if you have, yeah. I can't understand what that term was you just said. Risk limiting. Risk limiting. Risk limiting. Risk limiting. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. If you have a race that's a landslide, mm -hmm. Risk 80 limiting. to 20 percent, you want to check some of the ballots. But if the ballots, if everything looks like normal, at some point you can say, okay, we've seen enough. And this is one of the big advantages is that you can stop the audit right there for that race yes. and go on to the next one. Save time, money, etc. Mm -hmm. If it gets to be a really close election, you use statistics to figure out how many ballots you need to check. Mm -hmm. If it's really close, maybe you're going to have to check 800 ballots. 
or 500, whatever the statistics tell you to do, and here I refer to doc, uh, Dr. Philip Stark and other people check this, and, and yeah, okay. The advantage is you can run this if you are counting the ballots in that close race and things aren't coming out right. You count more. And you keep counting until you get to a 95% level of confidence that the results are correct based on the statistics. Which state's doing 95? Huh? California. Are they? Because you know what Colorado did, don't you? That's what? They went to uh, 91 or 89 or something. 91 is not enough. 95 no, exactly. in California. <laughs> oh. So you use statistics to figure out how many ballots you count and you limit your risk to 5%. That's where the name comes from. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's <coughs> county optional. County optional? County optional. They may or may not, they can do it if they want, they don't have to. So you can find out what your county's going to do, and especially if they're doing it, I would be inclined to kind of go watch and, and see how it's done and see if there are problems. And this is only for 2020? Only for 2020. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Make sure the comment. Um, I was um, going over Proposition 8. Do you want to talk ago. into the microphone? Yeah, okay. I was going over Proposition 8 uh, to give gays the right to marry uh, a bunch of years ago. And Mike Connell's. Um, company had been distorting the election. Bob, you remember this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was looking over all the vote totals for all of California for Prop 8 working with Steve Freeman. And they, the way that they made Prop 8 lose uh, is they, they had tons of votes in about five counties. Uh, I mean, five um, precincts. precincts, just yeah. huge amounts. And then I was sitting at the Voter Rights Task Force with Richard talking to Barbara uh, from Verified Voting, and I said, I, if you just skimmed 1% off the top or 2% off the top, I wasn't sure that these huge anomalies would be taken into account, and I was worried about it. So. Um, I would think if you wanted to steal, you really try to stack it in a few places. I, I don't know, I'd like to hear your comments on this. Sorry, I had the same concern. Oh, really? And I asked Dr. Stork about that, and I started asking him, and I immediately figured out what the answer is. Because you're not taking X percent of precincts anymore. Oh. You're taking the whole county, and taking X percent of the ballots from anywhere in the county. So as Dr. Stark likes to call this, you're taking a you know, pot of soup, and you can grab a sample from anywhere in the pot, and you're going to get the same results. So he's taking all the ballots as possible audits and selecting at random some number of ballots checking if everything's going fine, you're done. If everything's not going fine, you escalate. You count more ballots. And that's part of a risk limiting audit. I think an interesting idea would be to have that system say, hey, you know, there's a 80% chance you're going to get to a full hand recount. So just do it. And in these discussions going on with the people writing the bill, I repeated several times, hey, what happens if you get to day 29 of the 30-day canvas period and you're doing this and you find a problem? Mm -hmm. You're out of time. Mm -hmm. ah, well. right. And I, I repeated that and this sort of said, we're going to sort that out in the regulations. So they have a committee working on regulations. I haven't seen the results yet. 
But I made enough noise about it, I think, somewhere they, they're going to have to pay attention to that and either ha allow a judge to extend the 30-day canvas period or I don't know what. But it's something you can see coming. Mm -hmm. They're going to run out of time. <coughs> they, can, they can run out of time with the 1% manual tally, but they tend to just go blithely along. And, and is and a smaller percentage a lot less extensive? Yeah. Yeah. There are definite efficiencies for doing these. I've seen them done, and there are definite percentages for doing these. But where there are problems is when you run out the clock, and you start a process that can't take you across the finish line, and you're really lawyered up. Uh -huh. and, and, and and then you have the question, and there's no one like I really appreciate what Jim said. There's no one answer. There's a question of like, what's the best choice given the pluses and minuses? you're defining a different level of what's good enough for accuracy. 95% versus attempting to have you know, a full accounting. You do the full accounting by hand, it takes a long time. You use digital technology and images, it can be short, but do you have a library, can you get to it? You know, so this is the spectrum, mm -hmm. and this is what the smartest people on our side are, I mean, the pro-transparency side that have been in this since Ohio have come up with. So, what, what, if I could just risk, say. The risk limiting audit is the, Th that's one, and the ballot image audits is oh, another, and okay. the, the ballot image audits are newer. Mm -hmm. The risk limiting audits came out of, it's really important to note the genesis. It was post-Ohio, where Bob was at, and nobody could, could trust those first generation of Diebold machines and everything like that, so nobody wanted to touch anything electronic. They just wanted to deal with the paper, and they wanted to come up with a mathematical way to, to do this. Okay. But it's a complex process. Okay. and and. and the smartest people were at the ballot image, the ballot audit summit at MIT last January, and Philip Stark was demoing it, and half the room, which is full of PhDs, couldn't follow his instructions. Wow. You need two semesters or two years of statistics to really understand. Joe yeah. Sixpack's not going to get it, but I'm endorsing risk limiting audits. Okay. Um, can I comment? And also, can we just say why? Because they help prove that the images are real. We get all the images. We want risk limiting audits to match and marry to prove that the images are real. Because anything can be gamed. Mm -hmm. This is the real world. Mm -hmm. We were in an election. They, they duped. They ran off new ballots. And they had machines mark them. And it was incredible the ordeal. 30,000 ballots. That was part of the RTA $2 billion heist. They made the ballots disappear for six weeks took them up to Maricopa County. We were out there demonstrating, trying to teach them. You know, we need redundancy. We need a hand-marked paper ballot going in. We need to have an image. I'm sorry, you, nobody's gonna get at the ballot real easy because they're afraid you might have a piece of lead below your finger and you might make a stray mark. But they can give those images and they can give us risk-limiting audits to verify that the images, because right now, I'm not really worried about the election of 2024. I'm worried about the election now. I'm worried about the fact that I'm going to do everything I can to make elections transparent and trackable. I don't need to pass legislation, Jim. I need to make these assholes follow the law. Okay? That's what I love to do. Okay? And yeah, they'll probably figure another way to game the system because that's how it works. It is yin and yang. It's good and bad. It's evil and good. It's an oldest fight we've been fighting for a long time. I'm in that fight. Bill is in that fight all his life, okay? And I'm going to tell you what we think. We're not going to worry about what we can't do. We're going to worry about what we have to do. And that means informing people what's going on. And yes, I welcome risk-limiting audits, Jim. Okay? And they should welcome ballot images because of the redundancy. And what we need to do is work together. These petty little fights about my system's better than yours, no. No, we need them both. We need them all. And that's what I'm going to work for. And I thank public Phil Stark publicly for the work that he's done, just not on ballot, in, I mean, on risk limiting audits. His stands on ballot marking devices. We have more in common than we have differences. And I know one thing we have been working back channels, me and Susan Pinshaw. We are educating people all across the board in different spectrum, one at a time or in groups, to get them to understand that they need each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your question you had on it? I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say that without ever having taken a course in statistics, 
I got coached by Dr. Stark in how to uh, conduct an audit. It's technically not a risk limited audit, but we audited a percentage of the ballots that were counted during the last weekend in San Mateo County on a transportation sales tax that passed by a couple hundred votes. And we were able to ascertain that the copied ballots that replaced um, ones that had come in by fax or that had been spoiled, that they hadn't screwed around and um, <coughs> changed the numbers there. Okay. And so we were able to demonstrate that it had been a legit count. That's, we'll make the risk limiting audit. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It it's wasn't technically a risk limiting, uh, limited audit, but it was a percentage, mm -hmm. it was a statistical sample mm -hmm. that then gave us confidence that no, that it, they hadn't messed with it. And we had thought that they had. So It's the redundancy, stupid. That's right. <laughs> Jim, that's uh, right. Yeah. Only I'm going to get to a third leg of a redundancy. And it's going on uh, next door. There is a bill in the California legislature passed the assembly overwhelmingly sitting in a Senate elections committee, AB 1784, to provide state funding for open source election equipment. Good. San Francisco, I, I got involved in this stuff in 2005, February 26, 2005. I got the little button when Jim Marsh told me that the Debo machines had been programmed by a professional embezzler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I picked my jaw up off the ground, <laughs> I said, we're going to have to do something about that, including I want to look at the code the guy wrote. And so I wound up going to San Francisco and getting involved with people that have been fighting since 2005 trying to get this thing off the ground. 14 years. Mm -hmm. It's still not there. San Francisco's put in about a million and a half of its own money. And we're going to Sacramento or rich people, whatever, to come up with 10 million to get the thing done. And if you can talk to your state senator about AB 1784 and tell them to pass the damn thing, do it. I'll list a few advantages. It's beyond being able to look at the programmer's code. John has a lot of problem getting ballot images. He's got to go around and sue. Stop him from destroying them. Well, I mean, there was a lawsuit in Alaska that went two years trying to get the voter, the election database off of the machine. It took two years of lawsuits. Our guys won, and they said, oh, this is a national security issue. You can't look at it. <laughs> but we got him next. We were the first people in the country. Bill Reisner was that had the largest release of electronic databases in the history of voting. We got in 2007, and those databases helped me and others understand how crappy they really were, <coughs> especially when you work in the newer systems, because the newer ones that were set up by the EAC, giving the description what they wanted, were far superior than the garbage that came out of the Help America Vote Act. Mm -hmm. And it was just insanity what they gave us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, so it's hard to Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Trying to raise some money at all. Yeah, was, yeah, we well, are running into brick money. walls. Mm -hmm. San Francisco has a technical advisory committee. John saw those people, and he, uh, he and several of other of our colleagues walked away and said those guys are really good. I'm sure San Francisco yeah. could come up with a much better system than Dominion or ESNS or whatever. And I want them to build it. I want them to build it, to design it, code it, come up on a standard hardware and build it, and then let the entire state use it. It's not about San Francisco. I don't go 14 years into this just for San Francisco. It's the entire state, and then they make some adaptations. You can use it in every state in the country. Now, I'm not saying this is the only thing to do. I started saying I, I, I don't like people saying there's one way to do it. But this is the third leg of redundancy. Yes. Maybe we can accidentally get a proper count. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm urging support for that, not just for the code, but they'll get the files to even know who the programmers are, because when you do open source, they got to register and submit the code, and you know who wrote the code. You can find out if the guy has 23 convictions for embezzlement. Red flag. <coughs> um, okay. Federal, um, <coughs> federal legislation, the, the phrase Moscow Mitch has come out, and I think that it's actually, he, that's fabulous. He's getting pissed about that because he's blocking two bills that have blocked, that, that have passed the House. One is a huge one. H.R. 1, which is the first bill they worked on in the House, and it does, among other things, something amazing. If you read the Constitutional Article 1, Section 4, it says that the times, manners, places, and manners of holding elections for senators, um, et cetera, et cetera, shall be decided by the legislature of that state. But the Congress may alter such regulations mm. if they want to. Mm. Mm. Nobody's touched that. What does that mean? I don't even think. The time manner. I'm hitting on the word manner. How you choose the representatives to the House of Representatives is determined by the states right now. Congress can rewrite that law. The Constitution gives them the right to determine the manner of the choosing of the members of the House of Representatives. Oh, Nobody's wow. touching it. Wow. Well, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, who's head of the House Administration Committee and a fabulous, uh, she's the expert on elections, she inserted this thing. I had heard her hinting at this 10 years ago. Oh. Well, she got this thing in there saying, Congress could rewrite law about gerrymandering. We will do proper drawing of districts for the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of do the math or let that rattle around in your head a bit and imagine that the districts for the House are now fair. This is huge. This is the first time anybody even proposed it. And this is the one that Walker has passed. This is one that Moscow Mitch is, is, is killing. That's a huge bill, 600 pages. And it covers campaign finance. It's just the entire wish list of any, everything you wanted in one bill. And then Senator Wyden came in with a SAFE Act, which is much slimmer, paper ballots, and a bunch of other things that also got out of the House and is now sitting in front of Mitch McConnell. What number of bills is that? Is that 2773 or what is it? Senator Wyden, I believe it's the Safe Act. Okay, yeah. Good um, really good Secure name. America really Federal good. Elections is, I think, what it stands for. And I reviewed it quickly. It's very good. I got an email from somebody saying maybe this is the time to go after McConnell. Maybe? Go after the what? Go after <laughs> Moscow Mitch. You think? <laughs> and try to force him to pass one or both of these bills. Oh, which one? What I'd be very happy. I mean, either one. I would be happy really? with either one. I mean, the HR one is so big that it would do an awful lot more. That would be great. It will also get more resistance. The Wyden bill is slimmer, but it gets at essential points about conduct of elections. How do you force him to do anything? How do you get him to do anything? Wait, I saw some somebody say that McConnell's favorability ratings in Kentucky are now down to 30%. Okay. They're selling t-shirts all over uh, <laughs> Moscow, Mitch, uh, <laughs> Moscow, <laughs> Mitch, 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 Moscow. You just had Mueller sitting there saying, we are being attacked as we sit here. But, but they're That's wearing cool. these t-shirts now all over Kentucky, you know, because they're selling them for five dollars each. So, I mean, that's that's, that's like little billboards all over Kentucky. Right. So, yeah, I like uh, so there's this, really there's a possibility and sort of watch for news on your favorite social media and, and, and jump in. Went from two point six million dollars in two thousand and five to twenty six million dollars, I think. 
in 2015 wow. or, you know, last year. Or, you know, it jumped up by over $20 million in 10 what, years. Over what, 20 what jumped up? His, His income. income. Oh, oh. Yeah, well, surprise, surprise. Uh, I just read that this morning. So, uh, do, you, so do either of those bills touch gerrymandering? <laughs> the first yeah. one does. Yeah, it's the HR down. one bill does. <laughs> and campaign finance, in the Voting Rights Act, and, 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 and. Okay. I've seen somebody always oh, should kill this because of some detail. you got to be nuts. We've got a dozen major things coming through, and I'm not going to kill a bill for one little detail. Does, does this take into account the census? <sighs> I can't answer that. What would you say? Okay. The, the census. census. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap up here. I think watch for some opportunity to jump all over Mitch McConnell. I'll jump over. Wow. Uh, wow. I don't know. I'm mean, sending in letters, getting people in Kentucky to send in letters and put up billboards about Moscow Mitch. It's about a third of what we get done here. There is an element of dumb luck. <laughs> this is one of those cases. Where you have Mahler sitting here and saying, yeah, we're being attacked as we sit. And somebody comes up with, and McConnell's blocking these bills, and somebody comes up with the phrase, Mitch, uh, Moscow Mitch, and it goes viral. And if you told me two weeks ago I could plan that ahead, no. But it's sitting there, and with just a little bit of discussion of how do we use this. So I'm, I'm mentioning that <laughs> just so that you're aware of it. And I will finish with um, my favorite quote from President Josiah Bartlett. <laughs> Good president. A great president. Great president. Decisions are made by those who show up. That's right. You showed up here. Continue to show up because you are going to help make those decisions. Thank you. So I said five counties. That was in, for 2018 for the vote centers. Those yeah. were um, Madera, Napa, Nevada, Sacramento, and San Mateo. Eight more added in for 2020. Oh, great. So the eight that added in are Amador, Butte, El Dorado, Fresno, Los Angeles, Mariposa, Orange, and Santa Clara. And Marin Los Angeles. Angeles. Well, it Marin sure. was in the, in the first group. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, check your county. If, no, they, if you like the idea, you say, I like the idea, go to the Board no, of Supervisors and you register. Oh, it was it was yeah. Don't like this idea or don't like risk limiting rights. Yeah, it's um, the counties are making this decision now. Yeah. Yeah. Would, would you like to be an advisor for people to, you know, I mean, you know, we have... My email is jimsoper2 at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, what, what, uh, what's coming up for me is uh, a lot of deep concern about our upcoming presidential election, really deep. And uh, so I can definitely be open to guidance and also uh, want to act. And I'm sure that there's some people here who want to act too. And I mean, whether it's with the Voter Rights Task Force or something, um, I'd be willing to have both, send, you know, at least trust vote and possibly send my center if there's no candidate involved. Um, uh, well, I oh no, trust vote also. Yeah, give guidance to us. Like for instance, Bob said something really clear. You know, we don't want our registration screwed up. Some of us uh, who were independents voting for Bernie. Uh, registration screwed up. So I'm not saying this will happen this time. I'm just saying that <coughs> Bob said check your registration online and take a photo of it. Oh, mm -hmm. That was interesting. I, I, yeah. and, and you said do things early. And then you said find a way to counter Mitch McConnell. And I'm still waiting to hear 
from Steve what we can do in this, because um, I felt pain listening uh, to you. And I, I, I really don't want our country falling apart. <clears throat> I think if we're going to vote for Army, so we I, all I'm vote offering to, to give some <laughs> some suggestions along Mission's the line challenge. through Sunrise and Trust Fund. So yeah. I, I, will give, for, I will give. I will give. Hold the hold the questions um, until the end, please. Well, everybody's yeah. asking questions. Yeah. 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 On both centers, generally yes. Me? Just give him a job as a software consultant, and I know we get systems installed and things get screwed up. I like the idea is it's going to be running for 10 days yes. instead of it's all got to work uh -huh. on one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they have problems on, on day one and they got 10 days to work out, I, I think just from that point of view, it's an improvement. Convenience of being able to vote uh, next door. In Los Angeles, this makes a big difference. The registrar in San Francisco said, no, our city's too compact. We're not going to use it. On the risk limiting audits, I want to see it tested next year. I want to see some counties try it out and find out what the problems are, because there will be problems, and then decide if you want to move ahead or not. So that's a one-year commitment. That's not, that's not that serious, and it needs to be tested in real life and not just in theory or experimental lab tests or something. But some other people wanted to... He's so got yeah, a question um, right there. He's so I was wondering, point. so after um, 2004, in 2000, 2004, obviously the Republicans didn't decide not to steal a couple of elections. But I know various things happened, a lot of them do with the license protection community, that stopped them from stealing 2008, 2012. But I remember you expressing some serious concern about not being able to stop the fraud from overturning election in 2016. I'm wondering how you feel about two, how desperate we are to face in 2020. And if there's like one particular area, whether it's the stripping of votes or voters from polls, if there's one particular thing that we could focus on to best help. Well, well again, uh, I mean, it, it's a pattern. <coughs> and the fact that they can, uh, really without any logic behind it, deregister voters, uh, which is really what creates uh, in the battleground uh, states, right? Ohio, you know, unless you, there's no battleground in Ohio uh, in 2004 unless you get rid of 305,000 voters. There's no battleground in Ohio unless you get rid of 1.25 million voters in 08. So, <coughs> and, and it makes no logical sense. I mean, what I'm concerned uh, with now is, is sort of the last second. I mean, Ohio, the last time I looked, still was 40%, you know, uh, using uh, direct recorded electronics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that, uh, and this was the problem clearly uh, in uh, 2016 in Pennsylvania, if 85% of your machines don't have paper, you know, how in the hell do you actually recount or do a, you know, risk-limiting audit, right? I mean, all you're doing is, you know, pushing the same button, button and getting the same results. But as long as there's firmware that's proprietary, as long as there's source code that's, you know, proprietary uh, and no open source counterpart uh, to match it, or as long as the states don't require actual randomized and representative, you know, audits, there's still potential, you know, to move around the edges and uh, manipulate any of these elections. I mean, the fact that there's no national standards, and I think uh, Jim touched on that at the end. I mean, uh, you know, where are the national standards as to uh, you know what can go into a machine mm -hmm. but again as long as there's proprietary software uh, and the firmware I think you can steal uh, what you need particularly if you're stripping the voter rolls but I mean compared to what you felt about 16 how do you feel about 20 yeah it's I mean I don't feel a sense of tremendous uh, urgency. I mean, and, and really, you know, I, I, 
you know, Russia to some extent is the red herring. It's like, yeah, it actually happened. I'm glad it alerted people that, you know, uh, elections can be tampered with on voter registration. But there was in a broader discussion, for example, that some hearts, uh, inner civic machines still in loose, uh, still in use, have uh, zero out of 12 areas uh, in terms of election security. And if you get into uh, the voter registration, you can get into the entire uh, system. So I'm not feeling, I mean, uh, with the key private partisan proprietary company with links to the intelligence community still have the keys to the kingdom. Now, so we have to be forcing you know, the machines that give us you know, the most to deal with, the ballot images, those that can do audits, but you know, what's that gonna ultimately be? It depends on the state. In Ohio, it depends on the county. I mean, in Ohio, we still have two court decisions that says you can buy you know, all, all of this security, uh, you know, may, uh, the audit logs, the ballot images, but you don't have to turn them on. So I, I'm not <laughs> seeing sort of a tremendous will. Uh, I mean, no one you know, is saying, look, that's, it's like buying state-of-the-art security on your house uh, and never turning it on. It, it makes no sense. And we're not at that tipping point where, where virtually everyone sees it makes no sense. But we could be because of the Russia issue. Uh, yeah, because what, what do you mean because of the Russia issue? Well, I because mean, because it came up. Yeah, be, because Russia should be linked to. Yeah, uh, this is bad. Russia has this potential. So do a lot of other countries. But who's really got this potential is some real shady, questionable right. uh, people, <laughs> including a, a company, uh, Debolt, that went out of business because of a quote worldwide pattern of fraud. I mean, uh, you know, if they've got your gem systems, your counting systems, and they're still alive in the form of Dominion, why aren't we more afraid? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Woolsey uh, co-wrote an, uh, an editorial in the New York Times essentially saying that there's no need to have the proprietaries and we should be using open source. I mean, why isn't there a huge push towards o open source? or what they have in Wisconsin, right, where uh, you have to put the source code in escrow so people can look at it, computer experts, to see if somebody was tampering with it. California recorded the source code in escrow, too. Uh, Bill Gillis, it was Bill Gillis. I'm more worried now than I was yeah. 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, me too. Because when all these voter registration files are going online, which makes them more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. right. We're getting some junk machines that are deceptively mm -hmm. junk. Mm -hmm. uh, and something else that made me wor more worried is Joe Steinway's millions of dollars to hold recounts. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, then there was Florida and um, Nevada. Well, let's get to Bill. Bill, can Bill get another comment before we get too far away? Bill, can you go ahead? So, for those factors and the social media, which is new, yeah, I'm more worried now than I used to be. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I just wanted to toss out a little factual matter because I, I, I have no opinion on what California is doing in terms of ten days in Pima County, Arizona. They count the early ballots and in 10 days or two weeks before the election mm -hmm. they they print the results and circulate the results yeah. oh yeah. that's terrible they do that in ohio and, as well and uh and they have done that for decades we it, it's a felony in arizona but we had testimony in court from the workers saying yes we did that we did it all the time and we had a rubber stamp where we put on it and say this is uh uh, unofficial and it was circulated to the inside people there's no question that they did it and so what happens is if it's a close election the word goes out you need so much more uh -huh. it, or tell someone else you were going to make that million dollar media buy 
make it twice as much or not at all or half as much. You know what's going on when you've got time. How can you have that information available and it not leak out? Yeah. But I don't know how California's going to do it. I'm just, okay, it, so. it triggered in me facts because hey, we, we had a couple lawsuits on it. I did the deposition. I put the testimony in trial. It's true. It happened for us. And of course, like all things, well, in California, yet. when you, because so, I live in Sacramento County, so you, so for a couple of elections now, I've gotten the, the mail in ballot automatically. But when you drop that off, they don't count it until after they count the people who actually mm -hmm. show up on election day. Yeah, the sequence. So they count really? those yeah, votes first and then yeah, count yes. the ones that were dropped okay. off after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That just I, I believe most counties will be counting uh, vote County. by mail as they come in. I yeah. think so too. Yeah. I think they, they are. are. And, and, as they and then they out. stop doing that right. at the uh, on election day. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not how Sacramento County does it. Yeah. Well, that would be mm -hmm. unusual. And, and people need to insist that they put essentially the ballots back in the precinct because one of the ways to detect uh, whether there's fraud sometimes by separating them out uh, you can you get a much better feel when you get the precinct count in some areas including parts of Ohio counties they never return them to the precinct so you don't get any feel on the yeah. demographics and except, the predictions except Jim is saying no no precincts precincts are about there well, are some precincts there are precincts, precincts, but yeah. fewer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is something I've wondered for a long time. Maybe it's a really quick question, but I've wondered for a while if uh, if they uh, systemically target people registered as Democrat, and if that were the case, uh, if people. Uh, uh, just sort of collectively re registered as independent uh, or even Republican uh, and states change their laws uh, to allow people to vote in either primary or just, you know, maybe just do something to yes, not mm -hmm. have to indicate their, uh, that they were Democrat, that that might uh, thwart some of the um, the uh, role, uh, uh, deletion of Democrats off of voter rolls. So you're talking but general you know, elections, general not primary elections yeah. and local elections. Too. But but you know the overall uh, demographics, right? I mean, you you know, Cleveland voted 81 percent for Kerry, right? They uh, they eliminated 24.96 of every single voter registered uh, in, in Cleveland. Yeah. And they eliminated the blacker the district was, the higher the percent. Uh, in the district that had the highest percent of black people, they purged 51% uh, of, of the voters. I mean, it's, and again, it's, uh, you, you know that uh, blacks are voting uh, at, you know, 95% in, in that election. So it, it's easy enough to predict. You can do the same thing with the Hispanic population and the poor population. Uh, all that data exists, and uh, you know all the big data people have it. How is uh, voting by mail not the ultimate no. black box operation? How do your uh, verification techniques sort that out? We don't out? have enough verification. Post office needs to be tracking those ballots step by step, and that's not happening. So the mailbox has become the new black box. Right. Well, well, right. well, there are drop-off boxes. Yeah. There, you don't have to go through the post office at all. You can drop it off in person. You can. There are drop-off locations, or you can go right to the registrar with your ballot. And, and there's there are long, lots of places. Yeah, there's a long history of people uh, in in the 04 election freshly scrubbed young, uh, what appeared to be picked up, went to the nursing homes, had badges on, part of the mighty Texas strike, picked up hundreds of ballots, they just never made it. Uh, you remember in Franklin uh, County, there, uh, Matt Damschroeder, when he was there, uh, he's now the uh, you know, director of elections in Ohio, uh, but they put one stamp when the uh, mail-in required two. Uh, there were 10,000 sitting there uh, with not enough postage on them and had a uh, postal worker not squealed and uh, there was this tremendous outcry 
uh, on urban black radio, uh, mm -hmm. those things wouldn't have been counted. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, go ahead, Bill. Well, in Arizona, that is where they steal. That's right. It's through the mail-in ballots. Because mm -hmm. we have no uh, mm -hmm. auditing, effective auditing of mail-in ballots. Mm -hmm. California, too. Yeah. And just to give California you statistics, too. is that California. that's why I sued when we... Oh, oh this is worth the worst. That's know. why we wound up suing on the presidential election in Arizona, mm -hmm. the, the primary. Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. won the precinct yes. vote by 59 percent huh. hillary won the vote by mail by 60 and it violated the rule of large numbers okay oh, vote yeah. by mail is uh, depending if they're sorting and they're breaking it down to precincts you've got a good chance of getting it counted if they're just say you got a community that has a thousand precincts and the vote by mail is coming in and they're not sorting hey they got carte blanche mm -hmm. now and but, but to do that I guarantee you, they're gonna, if they're stealing, they will destroy the ballot images because they know they're a public record. Uh, in Arizona, like Bill said earlier, the only way we get a recount is if the results are within one-tenth of a percent. And what do you get? You get a machine count. If you understand fraction magic, it's gonna come out the same number because yeah. we have got to count on the same computer. That's a sign of insanity, isn't it? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Then they say, oh, you get to look at the unders and overs. Well, I know one thing, zero times zero is still zero. And a lot of us are dummies who don't realize it like me, because I bought off of that for eight years. I thought a logic and accuracy was real, and I was a fool for believing it. I should have believed Mickey earlier. I should have somehow found out in 2014, 14, after being in the industry, working this for many years, I thought everybody set up their own little database because they're not really programming, they're filling in boxes, okay? I assumed everybody did that. I was wrong. I found that there's a lot of consultants all across this country that are hidden below the tide <laughs> and they are doing programming yeah. and you'll find that that's going on. My God, the one we found was programming 13 out of 15 counties in Arizona. Yeah. We're well, finding yeah. them up, uh, in Arizona. Florida, the same thing. I yeah. mean, there's Those. consultants all over. Yeah. yeah. And they're going to steal where they have impunity. And impunity means you know you're not going to get caught. And that's how, the, how we look at elections. And that's why it's very for easy for me to go in because I got a rear view mirror and I look at the total system and I ask the right questions. And within probably two or three weeks, I got a pretty good handle of how the whole high school's down in the state mm -hmm. and what we can do to prevent. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yes, yeah, so I, I just want to go back to what, you know, we can really, we can drown in the details yeah, here, can. okay? And I want to go back to this question you asked and what Laurie said, you know, um, so where are we looking to 2020? And so, you know what? I think people make a mistake on both sides of the aisle in thinking that the next election is gonna be a repeat of the last election. And a lot of times we, we tell old stories instead of new ones. So there are some things that we know are gonna be different. And we know some things about what the challenges are, where you said like, what can we do, what can we do? So, you know, so the, the question really is not in terms of like, what can you do to reach voters or encourage higher turnout. We know that it's gonna come down to a handful of swing states with tight margins. And this is not California. <laughs> this is not gonna be one of them. So, you know, what people are thinking about is really who are the basically overlooked voters going to be and how do you reach them? Now, smarter people than me say ten, those tend to be people who don't vote in primaries. And, they t and then the question is, well, how do you reach them? And how do you identify them? Well, both parties are going to be going crazy trying to reach these folks. And we know the states. It's going to be Michigan. It's going to be Wisconsin. It's going to be Pennsylvania. It might be Florida. And, you know, and, and Ohio. Yeah. And, you know, and that's kind of, you know, un sadly, that's, that's kind of it. So, so the thing is, what's different in those states? Now, we, you know, after the <laughs> Russia hack, $380 million was appropriated by Congress to deal with cybersecurity for the first time since, you know, 2002 HAVA. So a lot of states are hardening their systems. And, I mean, look, if they didn't, weren't hardening their systems, um, Al Alderman's student would have gotten caught and investigated by the FBI. 
okay, look, you know, so, 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 and, and they went to caught this guy doing this absentee ballot thing in North Carolina. So the thing is, it is not the same landscape. And when, and when, you know, a lot of people said, what does Mueller mean, what they're doing it now? He never said what it, it was that they, meaning Russia, are doing now. And it really comes down to, is it an infrastructure thing or is it a political propaganda thing, which is a media thing, a social media thing. I tend to think it's going to be more on the social media side because it's harder to break into these systems and change numbers than it is to discourage people from voting. So, so that's like a new thing to look for about is what is happening now. And so, Laurie, you know, so, so here's the thing. A lot of these states are trying to buy new systems that have somehow, you know, better, you know, you know, a, a more, more of a paper record, however perfectly or imperfectly used or preserved or accessed. But, you know, whenever you have a new voting system, you have what's called usability issues. People are not familiar with how to use it. And mistakes get made, and everything is so emotional. And what's the support? And, and, and like, so you have states now that are on the verge of acquiring systems that are going to be used for the first time in 2020's primaries. Wow. So when you say like, what's different now and what can you do, I don't know the answer to those things. I can point at some things that I've noticed that you know I'm drawn to trying to figure out. Like for example, the Democrats want to increase participation in their caucuses. They only have two that really matter: Iowa and Nevada. Number one and number three. They want to have a remote voting option. And they're basically reviewing this. I've been reporting on it. They have realized, I've been at the Democratic Rules Committee meetings for several months in a row, because that's where they talk about this. They now realize that they're in over their heads. They are standing up an entire rented infrastructure that has yet to be built, and therefore is yet to be tested. And they are, they're embarrassed to back out. And they're hoping that they can run out the clock, and, these, and, and Nevada and Iowa will say, let's not do this. And, they, and those guys are emotionally committed to doing it. So that's going to be really true. They yes. are. They are. They're. they're they, 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 so what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, so, so what's going to happen is they're going to use you know a phone, the keypad on a phone as the ballot interface. They're going to receive login information by email with passwords and pin numbers, yeah. and it's going to and, and and this is going to fold into the election night tabulations. And a lot of people are really going to get pissed off when their favorite candidate does not qualify. So this is kind of what we're heading into. And when that happens, there'll be all kinds of noise about, hey, if the Democrats can't even run their own, their own stuff, how can they win in November? <laughs> so this is stuff that's not the same as 2016. And it's happening now. And I, you know, and I, Lord, I don't know the answer to this stuff. Sometimes I think you know, um, they should be more conservative and not try to introduce something at such a high level right. of risk and attention and stakes. But Again, it seems to me that you know a lot of attention is being paid to cybersecurity and you know and and the hacking side of this stuff. The other side of this, the disinformation and all the stuff that's going to be thrown at trying to find who are those overlooked voters. I mean, can you believe that in America there would really be people who haven't made up their minds? <laughs> but, but and that's but apparently there are and. Um, so that's what, you know, so, I, you know I, so I'm not answering your question very well, but what I'm saying here is, you know, it's not that what, I'm just saying like, what do we know? It's not gonna be the same as the past, and all we can do is try to be smart about looking at, you know, soft spots <coughs> looking ahead. And, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think we should give up. I so think, yeah. in 2018, Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin got Democratic governors instead of yes. Republican governors. So that should theoretically help with the purging in those states. Or gerrymandering. Yes. Well, but, uh, that is, well, maybe not the gerrymandering. No, it, absolutely with the gerrymandering. Because oh. see, gerrymandering is those maps are going to be drawn based on the 2020 census. And, 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 and they're, they're, they're going to be drawn in, you know, early in that next session. So and you need to have a veto person, somebody with a veto pen at the table. So that's why people are thinking, like Eric Holder, are thinking we can win one house back in Texas. Mm -hmm. And then you won't have maps that are as bad. As far as passing HR1 and, you know, legislation to redo the standards, that's, that's not going to happen with McConnell there. And the Supreme Court just said partisan gerrymandering is legal. Yeah. But do you think right. because of, do you think Florida, North Carolina, I guess Ohio, Missouri, and, Michigan? Okay, so what are the like, the key Wisconsin? Most, what are going to be out of the states that are going to probably swing the election? 
What should it, be the ones that would be the that concentrating on the most would be the you, most it's effective. it's where Trump is going right now, and they're not dummies. He's going to Michigan. He's going to Wisconsin. He's going to Pennsylvania. He's doing a little bit in Ohio. He's barely been to Florida. Yeah. Well, because that's. And those happen to be the state we're looking at real hard. Well, in Florida, I was just reading the thing, you know, about the Republican legislature putting in these, um, you know, poll taxes and these ridiculous fines that could go into tens of thousands, or they're saying even millions of dollars. I was reading on felons to get re-registered to vote. That seems like they've done enough right there to probably hold Florida red. But I don't, it, 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 I don't know. It, it's really... Short of somebody coming up with the, the fundraising ability, it really to pay depends off those on the. I'll tell you, it really de depends on the candidate. Yeah, I was reading in Arizona, you're not allowed to drive someone else to drop off a, a mail-in ballot. Oh, you know so what I mean? Uh, that's what they're trying to pass that legislature, I believe, in Arizona. It's not allowed to drive someone. Uh, oh, I mean, you know, voter suppression is getting. But that, I mean, that's just a variation, though, of 2000 Florida, right? When they asked everyone for their chauffeur's license, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the state police set up roadblocks. Oh, yeah, right. The Democrats won Florida. The Democrats won Florida when Obama was running because 100,000 more blacks voted in Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. And I was told that straight out by, you know, recount lawyers working for the Democratic Party who were there this last time. Mm -hmm. And and the thing about that was it was the candidate. Right. And that was that, that motivated the, the, those people to vote. And why did Andrew Gillum not win the governor's race? Because he won a primary that was in August and it was late and he didn't have any organization on the ground and he could couldn't get going. And he wasn't that, and he wasn't well known in Southern Florida. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, 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 sometimes it's not just the machinery, you know, it, 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 all the stuff we talk about how this process gets nickel and dimes comes into play when the elections are close. Because that's where you can run out the clock and fight over all this garbage. If the margins are big enough... Unfortunately, it seems like the margins, though, have to be 10% or more that a, that a Democrat would actually win by in a presidential election. Because they can steal six-point elections pretty easily. It depends on the been state. Shown. It depends on the state. Well, I mean, states like Ohio and well, it, you know. it, it depends on the state and it depends on the race. If it's a gerrymandered race district, which is House of Representatives and state legislature, and it's in one of those red majority states, you have a six to eight percent starting point advantage by virtue of you know they drew the lines around likely voters to turn out. You've got another two or three percent you add on top of that because of voter ID. You know, and how it discourages people. So you got a 10% starting line thing. So you see, so, so all those polls in Pennsylvania, where the Dem you know before the blue wave that the Democrats were ahead 15 points and this and that in polls, and then come election day they only won by three or four percent. What does that difference come down to? It comes down to these structural advantages: gerrymandering, six to eight percent, voter ID, another two or three percent, other things like you know, you know, move the polls this or that, another half point here. You know, that's how it all adds up. Yeah. That, that, you know. So that's what that's what that is. Doesn't it seem like if all this information about the vulnerabilities gets out, that in itself will suppress the vote because people will throw their hands up? And well, you know, people. That's why. why that's why Bernie doesn't talk about voting. He doesn't. He, he doesn't want to do it. But the thing is, you know, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. You can't solve the problem unless you know it's there. Right. And I, I wanted to answer a question that came in over the internet and be quick. Um, have risk limiting audits, if somebody fiddles with a tabulator, um, with fraction magic or something like that, will the risk limiting audit find it? 95% probability, yes, because they are taking the numbers at the end, coming out of the tabulator, and going back to the very beginning and comparing them to the balance. And if there's any fiddling going on in between, it should catch it. Um, I'd like to ask a question. So we have all these new machines coming out and this new technology, this ballot marking device. I have not been able to be effective because I don't have a source of information telling me about what the new technologies are and what their vulnerabilities are and why registrars shouldn't be buying them. Can we talk about what is coming on the market now? 
Sure. I mean, Worthwhile. yeah, I mean, look, look, here's the thing. You, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I know where to go and what to look at. You, you can look at the cost uh, and the features of these different models. There aren't that many models of machines. So, for example, North Carolina, where you know, some stuff happened this past week, where the Board of Election Chairman had to resign because he told a dirty joke to a, woman, a room full of mostly women state election officials. Um, <laughs> Really, and then we have a two talk to two tie on the board, and they may. I'm not sure what to do with the barcodes on their machines. You can go to their state site, and you can see where you know what machines are certified for use, and you can actually see, you know, what it, they'll have sales videos, and you can see, you know, what is the the, the the ballot of record or the document of record going to look like, and 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 it's and there aren't that many variables. You either have a piece of paper that is marked by hand or by a machine. Or you have a computer printout. It either prints texts or barcodes or some combination. And then you will know. I, I guess what I'm saying yeah, is yeah. I think our side needs to have this information available to well, anybody it, that wants it, to it, look it, at it, 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 it and it, have it right there. Well, verified voting. I don't their, have the verified, time to verified do this voting research to, myself. To, to their credit, has a web has a tool called the Verifier, and it goes to it goes to every county in America, and it lists every voting machine that's certified for use in that county, mm -hmm. and they're generally pretty up to date. Mm -hmm. It's called the Verifier by Verified Voting. No, no, I'm talking about new generation of machines that are being bought this year by Marin County, Sonoma County. And uh, yeah. I think there's another couple of them in the Bay Area that are buying systems. Uh, um, the truth is, I'm trying to find that same list too, and I'm having a hard time finding it because these these decisions are mm -hmm. are being made as of right now. Maybe, <coughs> maybe maybe Jim, you said you were looking at it. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to pre-announce a conference held by the Voting yeah, Rights exactly. Task Force mm -hmm. the la first weekend in October at the Berkeley Senior Center. Mm -hmm. So it is a, we're having, we, this is not officially announced, but right now it's all over the internet. Um, but we also hope that they have the nbrtf.org website serve as a center of information. Now, we haven't really gotten that, we're getting it started. We recognized the VRTF has, and I think a lot of other people, is there's no one go-to place. It sort of was Bev Harris's black box voting, but that's died. I tend, I would can recommend on Facebook, occupied rigged elections page. Occupied rigged. Occupy rigged elections. And uh, election integrity. I'm a moderator on both, and we do try to keep the the trolls out. Those are Facebook groups. Those are Facebook groups. And so there will be some current information going on there. I do have two Facebook pages, Voting Rights Task Force in Perens US and Voting Rights Task Force in Perens Calif, California, where I try to post important information and not a bunch of details. Uh, and so check there every week or two and see what's so, uh, new there. Are, is the Voter Rights Task Force, Richard, still meeting once a month? Like before? We are now ramped up to once or twice a week preparing for the conference. It's the oh, voting wonderful. rights task force, first of all. What? It's voting. the voting right not voter rights. Voting no, rights task force. Voting, voting rights. rights. Voting rights, okay. And uh, we're meeting now on Zoom and we're up to once a week now, sometimes twice a week because the conference, as you know, Lori, it takes a lot to do. You know, we're meeting, meeting, we're meeting online using Zoom. Okay. Uh, it's an online video conference. Mm -hmm. And what time? We're making it up uh, every, with, when one meeting's done, when's the next one? Uh, oh, and it's, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a regular, you know, uh -huh. the third Monday of, uh -huh. of the month or something. Like well, it used to be, okay. You know, it, it, we used to do it that way, and now we're using Zoom, and those of us working on the conference meet on Zoom and work out whatever problems we have to work on mm -hmm. or solutions. And I think the conference, we had a very good one two years ago, and I think this will be we as did. good. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had two. That's right. Yeah. Well, I just think it was great, and you know, that's what I've been hoping you were going to do, and I'm so glad you're doing it this year. Well, I mean, thank you, Bonnie, yeah, for organizing I, I think, this, I think and John, yes. for organizing uh -huh. yeah. 
Yeah, I also think that some of you are interested in these issues that are newer to it, even looking at some of what was on the other, the 2017 conference site. Yeah, yeah. 2016, can, 2017. Yeah, the, but particularly the second one. Uh, I think you can really educate yourself more uh, by just looking at Canada's cast and you slide down to the 2017 conference because they discuss a lot of different things and a fair number of things haven't changed. We had 22 speakers at Canada's cast at work. There's the CEIC conference 2017. I have every piece That's of information I can get about those speakers up on the one page. Great, great, and uh, uh, and then maybe you can add some of the new stuff too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I think we won't. Okay. Work on that. And uh, you know, I just hope for one thing for the conference is that uh, you know, Ed, thank you so much for doing the video. I was watching back there. You cannot believe the quality that he's recorded. There's some really out. Uh, crazy great stuff that was laid out here that now can be edited and put out and to other people mm -hmm. and presentations and uh, and I just want to say before this whole thing ends is it's really great to be with all my friends who mm -hmm. are on the front lines mm -hmm. because you know what that's where the battles run mm -hmm. when I was in Florida with the Reverend Dr. T uh, Spearman he said he sits on a board the third largest board in the state and he said in the presentation, we did two presentations together to the NAACP because you know, I'm falling in with them because you know one thing, uh, like we were talking about, I know where they're robbing. They're like bank robbers. Why did you rob the bank? Because that's where the money was. Why did they rob Broward County? Why did they rob Cuyahoga County? The other kinds, because that's where the votes are you want to suppress. Yeah, you might take out 10 people, but remember, seven and a half or eight are Democratic voters. It's what they do. And it's really wicked. And I'd say this, hooking up with the NAACP has been really great because they understood voter suppression. They understood gerrymandering. But they didn't understand the black box and the union that we got. It's proud to be in a group of people of color, and they call me their brother, and I call them their brother. And, uh, and it's a really great feeling mm -hmm. to be able to hook up. And, and, and what Reverend said to me that really was really interesting, he says, you know, I go to these board meetings on elections and there's nobody there, nobody from the public, unless we do something wrong. And then they come in and say, why did you vote that way? Because he says, because you weren't here to inform me. That's what we gotta do. And you know, when I gave my speech to the board, to that guy who got fired and who was trying to tell me that, that the timing marks around the ballot was barcode, I go, oh my God. This guy is trying to certify a system, and he doesn't have any idea. And he got that information from vendors who were trying to give him arguments to block what we were doing. We got to show up, just like Jim said. We got to go ahead and work on educating him, and we have to really work hard to bite our lips and keep our civility, because sometimes I just want to look at these people and say, "What the hell are you smoking?" You know, what I mean, it's that bad with some of the information. But Ed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is really incredible video that you shot, and uh, and you know you're really fantastic, and your friendship to me means a lot. It really does. Yeah. Nice. It's what you do. Nice. Thank you. So thank you, John, and thank you all of you for coming. And I'm yeah. also glad that I took the initiative I'm glad you to did create too, this here. <laughs> thank you, Laurie. Yeah, Laurie. Yeah. Uh, and I I am contemplating. <coughs> how to keep this starting to roll and to and to spread 